Hello and welcome to lecture number 34. Uh, this will be our first lecture in a uh, brief series on sedatives. We'll start off with a brief introduction to sedatives. In particular, in this lecture, we'll talk about what sedatives are and what they treat. Talk a little bit about their historical background, their sites and mechanisms of action. And then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about sedative-induced amnesia because this is a particularly important topic when we're talking about things like date rape drugs. In the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, barbiturates and uh, non-barbiturates, or norbarbiturates often they're called. Uh, then we'll talk about benzodiazepines. And then in the final lecture in the series, we'll talk about drugs to treat insomnia, anesthetics, and then spend a little time talking about a drug called propanolol uh, and its possible treatment uh, opportunities for PTSD. So what are sedatives and what do, are they used to treat? Well, generally they're used to treat anxiety disorders, uh, to treat insomnia and seizure disorders. These are often called sedative hypnotics. They have a calming effect at a lower dose and have hypnotic or sleep-inducing effects at higher doses. So these can be used to actually render you unconscious uh, or as potential sleep aids, depending on the type of, type of sedative hypnotic we're talking about. They are generally anxiolytic, that is, these are generally anxiety drugs, or tranquilizers, as they're often called, and they often have an anxiety-reducing effect. And we'll talk a, a great deal about the benzodiazepines and their primary use as anti-anxiety drugs. They are also anticonvulsants, so they suppress seizures and the associated motor reaction. In particular, the benzodiazepines <clears throat> seem to have a particular affinity uh, for this effect, so they're often used uh, to stop seizures in uh, medical settings. Again, they're generally prescribed by medical professionals, except in the case of alcohol abuse. Um, and of course, these can also be abuse drugs, so this can become a substance abuse disorder when they're misused. Uh, they can lead to overdose or withdrawal, uh, which can both be life-threatening. So we're going to spend some time talking about a particular Xanax because it's a common benzodiazepine, that if it's something you're taking daily, you can't just stop taking it because that withdrawal can be life-threatening. So these are important class of drugs to talk about because they are often used and abused, and in particular, it's important for people to understand the risks associated with them. So about 31% of fatal overdoses tend to involve uh, benzodiazepines, generally in combination with alcohol or other opioids. Um, the benzodiazepines are one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the United States in particular, and so uh, their use is important and I think very effective, but we have to be very cautious uh, about excessively using these particular drugs. So these sedative hypnotics can treat insomnia, can also treat anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. So these are all different uh, uses for this class of drugs, these sedative hypnotics. I want to make a couple of comments on a few of these. Certainly, these drugs can be used to treat insomnia, but they should not be used daily. That is, it should, they should not be used every night when you're trying to go to sleep because that can lead to a number of difficulties. Um, and oftentimes people have difficulty waking up or have other bad side effects. Um, similarly, for anxiety disorders and generalized anxiety disorders, um, they, for daily treatment, some of the um, antidepressants we talked about previously are probably better choices with maybe uh, a uh, prescription for something like Xanax uh, for occasional use, particularly for something like a panic attack. And so these are uh, important drugs, but have to be very cautious in their use. I want to give a little historical background. First, let's talk about anxiety. Anxiety disorders were first introduced in the DSM-3. Uh, they've... Uh, since been expanded to several categories, but generally, this is a type of common, common psychiatric disorder which is characterized by excessive rumination. This is where people constantly think about the same thing over and over again, constantly thinking, oh, why did I do this? Why did I do that? So sort of can't get away from thinking about stuff. Constant worrying, uneasiness, apprehension, uh, and fear about future uncertainties. 
And these can be based on either real or imagined events. And that's another important part about anxiety disorders, which makes them very difficult to live with. And also um, when you are dealing with somebody who has an anxiety disorder, um, they will often have beliefs about what's happening in the world that aren't necessarily reflected in reality. And this isn't hallucinations. It's just simply the way they're perceiving uh, the world around them. And so that's something to keep in mind. These can affect both physical and psychological health. As we talked in um, our lectures on depression, certainly high levels of stress and anxiety can be associated uh, with resulting in uh, depression. About 18% of Americans suffer from some form of anxiety. This has been increasing. Uh, there seem to be some generational effects on uh, some form of anxiety. Certainly, we often uh, live in anxious times, and certainly these are some very anxious times for many people. And so this is an important disorder to understand and an important disorder to try to get treated. We'll start with the uh, early sedatives in the mid-19th century. The bromide seltzers, as they were called, and chloral hydrate were introduced as alternatives to alcohol and opium. And so these were often also abused. Um, in 1912, phenobarbital was introduced as the first barbiturate. Phenobarbital is very rarely used uh, sedative. Uh, between uh, 1912 and 1950, about 50 different barbiturates were marketed uh, and uh, added to the market. And these drugs are very potent or can be very potent. And so um, can often be very, very dangerous. And that's one of the things we'll talk about um, in the next lecture on barbiturates. Then we get the benzodiazepines in the 1960s. Uh, Librium was first introduced, introduced in around 1960, and that was the first benzodiazepine to be marketed. The benzodiazepines are um, a class of drugs that are classified by their structure, um, but they all have fairly similar effects, and we'll talk about the receptors here in a moment. Uh, the sort of big dog in this is, of course, Valium, or diazepam, was introduced in 1963. And Valium became the most prescribed drug in the, 19, in the United States sorry, from around 1969 to 1982. And so this was a pretty significant drug uh, to be used uh, throughout that period. We'll talk when we get to the benzodiazepines about Valium. It's actually a really good muscle relaxer, and so it's one of the uh, uses for it is to actually, it's called an antispasmodic. And so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we get to uh, benzodiazepines. But these come around in the 1960s. Uh, these became sort of part of the social fabric and also a pretty significant target. Um, many of you probably read Valley of the Dolls. Dolls referring to those pills. Um, and in fact, Valley of the Dolls and uh, other uh, similar novels are actually uh, feminist statements about how women were being drugged to be controlled. And I think there's probably definitely something to that. This sort of comes out of the idea of women as being hysterics or being hysterical. Um, and so controlling women through pharmaceuticals became sort of part of uh, this question in drugs like, or sorry, in books like Valley of the Dolls, The Stepford Wives, and other. Uh, novels. There's a really great book by David Hertzberg called Happy Pills in America that I highly recommend. So that's sort of how we got uh, through the uh, 70s. Uh, it was a big part, 60s and 70s were a big part of that uh, social fabric. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the sites and mechanisms of actions of these particular drugs. So newer, newer drugs tend to be named by the receptors to which they bind or that underlie in their major clinical actions. Uh, there are specific binding sites for both barbiturates and benzodiazepines on the GABA receptor that have been identified. So that's what's causing this uh, anxiolysis as well as sedation is that activation of the GABA receptor. So benzodiazepine receptor agonists act on GABA neurons at the limbic centers. Actions at other regions produce side effects such as sedation, um, the increased seizure threshold, which means a re reduction in the uh, possibility of a seizure. Cognitive impairment, amnesia, and muscle relaxation, relaxation sorry, um, or antispasmodic activities. But those benzodiazepine receptors that act on uh, GABA neurons at the limbic centers, in particular the amygdala, 
some of the surrounding areas are where we get a lot of the anxiolysis. That's where we get the re reduction in anxiety is by acting at the limbic center. It's also possibly where uh, we get some of that amnesia. Take a look at the uh, GABA receptor. We can see sort of ethanol, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, uh, the volatile anesthetics like halothane, and then there's also a receptor for propofol. And we'll talk a little bit about propofol uh, later on. But essentially what these do is they uh, alter the uh, profile of that GABA receptor to make it more likely that it's going to inhibit that neuron. So if we think about this neuroanatomically, the amygdala, orbital frontal cortex, and insula are associated with the production of some of the behavioral responses. So this is where we get some of that reduction in anxiety, uh, et cetera. If we lesion these structures in animals, we can get this reduction in anxiety as well. And if we look at positron emission tomography scans or PET scans, we can see that there is increased amygdala blood flow that are associated with anxiety responses. We also see that in MRI scans, we get amygdala abnormalities in panic disorder patients. And so it's both that amygdala seems to be really associated with anxiety and panic disorder. And if you think about what the amygdala is for, it's part of our sort of primal emotional center, fear, anxiety. And fear is an important component of survival. But when it's out of whack with your actual surroundings, that's when it becomes disordered. Fear has its place in our lives. Um, fear and anxiety in, in some level are associated with everyone at some point. It's when that response is in association with things that aren't, shouldn't be anxiety inducing or uh, constant anxiety that's disrupting a person's life. That's when we have to think about trying to treat. So I want to talk uh, for a minute about sedative induced amnesia. And pretty much all of the sedatives um, can in some level cause this kind of amnesia. We'll start with what we call alcohol blackouts. Um, this is where people are, you know, drunk but still awake, um, doing things but have no memory for that. that. Um, this is a particularly dangerous thing if you're somebody who's somebody's having blackouts. Um, it's probably a good chance that they need to dial back on their drinking. Uh, they particularly need to think about um, not combining them with sedatives. Um, oftentimes, people will take Xanax or Ativan. Um, along with alcohol, and that can really uh, be dangerous. And so this is something to be uh, very cautious of. GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid is, of course, very important in the role of these uh, functions. So we th memories are thought to be formed partially by a process known as long-term potentiation. There are a number of other processes involved, but LTP or long-term potentiation is a change in the connectivity of neurons. And this appears to be an important part of how memories are formed. What we know is that GABA reduces long-term potentiation in the, <clears throat> in the hippocampus where these memories are formed or created. So if we boost GABA activation from drugs, uh, we can result in what we call a drug-induced reversible organic brain syndrome, which is essentially a temporary amnesia where a patient or person is awake um, and responding but doesn't have any memory for that event. And that's where... Um, we have opportunity and danger. So this is a really important part of understanding these drugs uh, because uh, this is essentially what date rape drugs are used for is to render somebody not very capable of responding but also so that they don't remember the event um, so they can't testify. But let's talk about these sort of potential for abuse for these date rape drugs. All these sedatives have the potential to cause amnesia at varying doses. Some drugs have very potent amnesic effects. In particular, uh, gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB and rohypnol are the two that are most associated with uh, date rape drugs. Um, the drug Versed or midazolam is used almost entirely in clinical settings, uh, but certainly has the potential for this abuse. And Ativan or lorazepam uh, also has pretty potent amnesic effects. What's very important to understand is that people who are under the influence of these drugs are unaware that there's anything wrong with their memory at the time that they're under the influence of those, and that comes from some of my research. So what we've shown is that people don't realize that there's anything wrong with their memory and that they won't remember something later. And that's something uh, to keep in mind about the way these drugs work, is that even outside of um, this type of 
horrible abuse of these particular drugs. Uh, people oftentimes will not realize that there's anything wrong with their memory. And that's, again, uh, really problematic. So these have really dangerous potential for abuses date rape drugs. And so one of the things I always caution is just, you know, be mindful, be careful. Um, I know more, uh, more than a few people who have uh, been slipped either GHB, uh, primarily GHB, um, and have very bad side effects, including myself. Um, and so you want to really watch out for that. You don't want to go up and down because it's just not very much fun. Um, and that's... That's all that happened to me in that case. There are other cases that I know of that much worse things happened. So just be very cautious when you're out and go out with friends and um, just take care of each other. That's really all I'm saying. Okay. So I want to get to the clinical uses of these drugs um, because they do have uh, some important clinical uses, in particular midazolam. It's used for what we call conscious sedation procedures. So some clinical pa uh, procedures require patients to be awake and responsive because you have to move or answer questions or um, like in the case of an endoscopy, you have to help swallow that endoscopy tube or if you're having your wisdom teeth pulled out, oftentimes they need you awake enough to you know, hold your mouth open and move and turn and do other things. So often in these cases, you give them a Dazlam, uh, Halcyon or Triazolam is another uh, drug that's often used uh, to alleviate anxiety and also to keep from remembering unpleasant procedures. If you go in for out, outpatient surgery, uh, I would say more than nine times out of ten, this is the first thing that you, you get, or even inpatient surgery. Um, it's the first thing they're going to do. You get into surgery prep. Um, anesthesiologist is usually the first person to come in and talk to you. And um, one of the reasons they give you this drug is to keep your heart rate down, keep people from having anxiety about the procedure, and that's part of what they do. Um, in other cases, burn patients oftentimes are kept on sort of a steady diet of midazolam uh, to prevent traumatic memories of treatment because that burn treatment is very, can be very traumatic. And so kind of keeping them uh, sedated for that is part of the sort of general procedure. So uh, we'll talk later in um, when we specifically talk about um, Benzodiazepine sedatives, we'll talk about midazolam and some of the research that's been conducted um, uh, using midazolam as a model of amnesia. Because the other thing about this is it allows us to study how amnesia works in healthier patients. So we'll talk more about that. All right, uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about barbiturates and non-barbiturates.